I still sometimes miss our Warner Road Church where you all felt closer. So I just thought I'd move closer to y'all. <laughs> it's wonderful, so wonderful. I'm going to just do this. So wonderful to be with you all today, to look at your faces, to feel your love, to know that this is my home. And I hope most of you feel that it is your home too, or becoming your home. Welcome. I thank Reverend Andy for giving me the opportunity to speak a few times every year, even though it makes me nervous. I know you're with me. Some of you know at least parts of the story I am about to tell. For some of you, it is a new story. It was the summer of 2010, but I still remember the day as if it was yesterday. I was attending a music conference in Madison, Wisconsin. After lunch on the final day, I turned my cell phone back on to find several texts from my then 12-year-old daughter, Jolie, who was in the hotel room with her dad, my late first husband, Russ. Many of you knew Russ. Urgent, she kept texting. Urgent, call me. Dad needs to go to the ER right now. At that moment, my whole life changed. I canceled the class I was supposed to teach, went straight back to our hotel, and took Russ to the ER. He spent the night in the hospital and had an endoscopy th the next day. While I drove 600 miles round trip to take Jolie to a gymnastics camp in northern Wisconsin, she had been waiting to go there all week and I couldn't let her down. I returned to Madison late that night to hear that something had been found inside Russ that shouldn't be there. Thus began our long journey with Russ's stomach cancer, greatly complicated by his long-standing Parkinson's disease, which had mimicked some of the cancer symptoms. Just because one has one terrible disease doesn't mean one is immune to another, unfortunately. What, what is the proper response to a broken heart? I have no idea. All I know is that the only way I endured those years was to actually go further into my pain, into my brokenness. The image Stephen Levine suggests in his book, Healing into Life and Love, is to visualize pain, pain as being part of a physical place deep in one's belly. Visualize it and breathe into it instead of running from it or shutting it off. Recognize it as a friend. Feel it. Send it warmth. Don't ignore it or close it off. But my life was so busy, so busy trying to manage Russ's various medical tests and physical symptoms. I had little time to myself. I didn't even cry for an entire month until I lost my planner. Then I wept the entire day when I lost that planner. It felt like the last little bit of control I had over my life, over our lives. How do we go deep into pain when we have to compartmentalize to even get through one day and to do everything that only we can do? I turn to the two best ways that I have always used to deal with stress and deep emotion, walking and music. I drew upon recordings of songs that would almost guarantee to make me cry. But I also chose music that had beauty and hope and helped me feel brave. 
some months later, I realized that most of what I was listening to had the cello in it. Something, something about the cello is so warm and connects us with both our human mother and our mother earth. I often walked and wept for hours, usually late at night, staying outside in our cul-de-sac where Jolie could call me if I was needed. What did all this walking and weeping provide me? Healing. I would go back into the house and face more confidently what had to be done, whether it was to clean a wound, listen to Russ describe his night terrors, or tell, tell Jolie how proud I was of her for having to parent her own father and for her kind heart. By, our, by allowing ourselves to go into our pain and experience it at its most racking, wrenching level, somehow this also allows us to be exquisitely open, open to beauty, open to love, open to gratitude. Through embracing our pain, we can cultivate a grateful heart. At least, that is my daily practice, because it, it is never finished, it is never complete. It is a chosen way of life. On the most difficult days taking care of Russ and then after his death, I tried to breathe into the ache of pain in my belly. Breathe in, breathe out, until what emerged was an awareness and then a gratitude of something quite different from pain. This something usually appears, at least to me, as a beautiful image, an image to hang on to, or sometimes a memory, or a special moment in my day that I begin to realize is actually a blessing. Images and memories like holding hands on the way to Mayo Clinic, a hot meal from a friend, many of them came from you all, a luminous face breaking through the physical pain, a dry joke that the nurses did not pick up on, <laughs> a desert sunset outside a hospital window, a family surprising me by putting up my Christmas lights so I could see them when I came home from the hospital. That would be the Middletons, Austin's family. They put up our Christmas lights three years in a row. A farewell kiss, some moments of lucidity coming out of frightened confusion, an email of love and encouragement across the miles from a family member or a dear friend. I am so very grateful for these lessons, these lessons of pain, of healing, of gratitude, this and more, much, much more. When I asked Russ if he ever resented those who could still walk and hike and mountain climb, he said no. He was only resentful of those who had strong bodies that didn't appreciate them. St strong bodies that they didn't love and use every day. He was only resentful of people who were healthy but didn't take moments each day to get up from the computer and stretch or get off the couch to go cook to love, to climb, to roll. That's what he was resentful of. Some of you today may be feeling your own emotional pain. How do any of us get past that deep hurt to a place of healing and even gratitude? How do we heal 
our broken hearts. Perhaps the image Stephen Levine suggests will help you as it has helped me. Don't ignore or close off your pain. Breathe into it. Recognize it as a friend. Feel it. Send it warmth. Embrace it. Every day, cultivate a practice of a grateful heart. By allowing myself to experience my pain and keep my heart open, I have done much healing in the last few years. On the second anniversary of Russ's death, I was on an airplane back from a trip to New York City. On that anniversary, I thought I might just sleep on that night flight, but instead I couldn't stop watching the magnificent stars out the window. It had been a stormy winter, but on this night in March 2014, it was clear and beautiful all across the United States. So I stayed awake. Russ had been a very good amateur astronomer, and I kept remembering all the stargazing we had done. And I almost couldn't even feel sad. I just felt profoundly grateful for his life, for the three children we had raised, and also for the new life that I felt ready to start to create for myself. For less than two months after that evening flight, I met the wonderful man sitting right here. I had asked the universe, I actually talked to Russ, I asked my people who have gone before me, just find me someone with a generous spirit and a big heart. And as many of you know, his name is James Hart. We feel so lucky to have found each other in May of 2014. Found each other in the vast pool of madness that is Match.com. <laughs> we got engaged just a year ago last weekend, and we were married here in this church on Valentine's Day. 300 people there, many of you were there, sharing our great joy. Of course, it is at times scary to choose to deeply love someone again. Because, of course, to love is to risk losing the person one loves. But I don't know any other way. It has been 25 years this week since my mother died at age 58. My father was 60 when he died. My younger sister was 48. I understand all too well that one never entirely gets over the deaths of such close, close loved ones, especially at such relatively young ages. Who would want to get over them? The pain is a measure of our love, and we want to remember them and still feel connected to them. And it is sometimes the happiest occasions when we miss them most. At a wedding when a father is missing, at a graduation when a grandmother is not able to say how proud she is. I know that there will be more of these moments, often unexpected and unbidden. But when sadness is triggered, it does not need to cancel out joy. Both of these can be held within the open heart. And within that heart, a spirit of gratitude can still be found. As the poet William Blake says, joy and woe are woven fine, clothing made for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. But even if we are able to keep an open a heart through our own personal pain, what about societal pain? What, what about the pain that comes from knowing 
that the evils of the past are still causing great harm in our country today. The theft of land from Native Americans, the oppression of slavery, the current anti-immigrant fervor, mass incarceration of young black men, the harm our lifestyle has done to the earth. How can we even feel okay about sitting down to Thanksgiving, to Thanksgiving dinner? How can we feel okay with such burdens from the past and immense problems of today staring us in the face? As UU Minister Galen Gingrich said in his Thanksgiving sermon just last week at All Souls Unitarian in New York City, he said, Thanksgiving may well be our most emotionally and morally complicated holiday, and one that has arrived at an emotionally and morally complicated time. But like Reverend Gingrich, I would ask us to embrace the pain of the past so that we can transform it into the promise of the future. Cherish, cherish and celebrate your blessings. Cherish and celebrate your loved ones. Cultivate gratitude as a way of healing. But then ask yourself, what more can you do to open up your heart, to open up other hearts and allow more healing into our shared world? One of my favorite singer-songwriters, Unitarian Universalist Peter Mayer, composed a song called The Japanese Bowl. That image of a bowl, cracked and broken, but filled with gold, comes to me often. In Japan, they apparently do not usually throw out bowls when they become cracked. They fill those cracks with gold gold so that they can become stronger and more beautiful. I try not to deny or push down, block my brokenness, and I wouldn't want to hide my cracks. I wouldn't want to hide my scars. I wouldn't want to hide my tears. Because like Stephen Levine, I remind myself to keep breathing into that pain and take time to feel it. Because we are human, because we have hearts that can be broken, we also have hearts that are flexible. Our hearts can bend. Our hearts can break. Our hearts can forgive. And our hearts can love again. When we keep our hearts open, we not only are allow ourselves to grieve fully, but we are allow ourselves to become more compassionate for others who grieve and hurt. And over time, and with practice, we can hold gratitude in our hearts for all that is our lives. Amen.